All right, welcome to a somewhat unexpected episode of PC Tech. So I will be building a 486 PC using the Intel 486DX4100 CPU. So I am going to spend a little time explaining why it is that I'm doing this because the reason is not necessarily the one that you might expect and it is an interesting reason. So I'll get into that in a moment. Once I've done that, I will show you the board I'm using and we'll do an initial hardware test to make sure that it works. I will spend a bit of time physically putting this system together in an open frame chassis and basically getting everything set up so that it's nice and secure and robust and this will involve a bit of hardware work including drilling some holes, tapping them, and there's also a little bit of 3D printing. I will then put together the full hardware setup with all the devices that I would like to use and I will do something to test them all just to make sure that everything's working and I may install some software, probably it will be free DOS, but we'll see. Okay, so let me go ahead and explain why it is that we're doing this. All right, so here's why I'm doing this. Next semester, so spring 2024 here in the Northeastern United States, I'm teaching an operating system course. So my day job is as a teaching faculty member at one of our local universities. And in this next semester, I'm going to be teaching an operating systems course. So the series of projects I'm planning to have the students do will involve them implementing an operating system kernel that is capable of running on real hardware and in particular 32-bit x86 systems such as the 486. So when students do their development and testing and debugging of their operating system kernel, they are primarily going to be running it on a software emulator that just emulates a 32-bit x86 system. So it totally makes sense to have students do the bulk of their development on a software emulator. It's just feasible to give them access to an emulator. They don't need any special hardware setup to, to do this work. Also, emulators often have debugging features that are are useful and it's just in general more straightforward to do the development work on the emulator instead of actual hardware. However, I really think it's important to have testing on real hardware be an option. I would really, really like to see students boot an actual operating system kernel that they have implemented on a real, actual, realistic hardware platform. And for a number of reasons, the 486 PC category of hardware is more or less a perfect target for novice operating system kernel developers. So the reason that the 486 and to some extent the 386 are excellent targets for operating system development is because they really are modern CPUs. And the big thing that they have is paged virtual memory. They have a, an actual proper memory management unit. And this really was the feature that prior x86 CPUs lacked that prevented serious operating system kernels from running on that hardware. So I was thinking about going into an extended rant about the IBM PC and DOS and just the frustrations of working in an operating system environment where there is no memory protection and how any bug in any program could corrupt the entire state of the system and crash and how awful it was to try to use software in this era. And I guess I have gone on that rant a little bit. So uh, to bring this back to our focus here, having an MMU and having virtual memory and having proper memory isolation between processes was just absolutely huge in terms of making the PC architecture useful for doing serious work. So even though the 386 and 486 are modern CPUs in terms of having a proper paged memory management unit, nonetheless, they still basically are an IBM PC AT in terms of the peripheral hardware that we have. So we have an 8253 as the interval timer, an 8259, actually two of them, as the interrupt controller. We have an 8255 to control the parallel port. So these are the same peripheral devices that appeared on the original IBM PC. They're very straightforward to program. If you have seen my 8-bit computer series. You know, we use an 8254 as our interval timer. We have an 8255 for our GPIO. These are simple devices to program. And so what that means is that you have a modern CPU that has very straightforward peripherals that it's easy to write device drivers for. Because on a truly modern system, there's just an enormous amount of complexity in both the firmware like UEFI and also the peripheral devices and the bus control 
controllers, and it is just many orders of magnitude more complicated than programming these simple devices. So that, in my opinion, makes the 386 and the 486 a sweet spot for operating system kernel development. So that's why I want to have a 486 system is because this is the platform the students are going to be targeting. I want to have an option to boot their code on real hardware. All right, enough yapping. Here's our board. This is the HS 5x86 HVGA industrial single board computer. So uh, LGR actually did a video where he built a system using one of these. So I will link to his video down in the description, but we have our 486DX4100. We have an ALI chipset. So a moment ago, I mentioned all of these simple 8-bit peripherals like the 8253. They don't actually appear as discrete devices on systems of this era. They're basically integrated into the motherboard chipset. Let's see, we have uh, IDE, we have Floppy, uh, there is a VGA controller, Cirrus Logic. It's actually a PCI device. There's an internal PCI bus here that connects the, the video. We have a serial port, PS2 keyboard, PS2 mouse. So complete system. I have 32 megs of memory in, uh, installed here. So one thing that you'll notice here is that this looks like an ISA card. It is an ISA card. So industrial PCs often use a passive ISA backplane. So here's my, my backplane. And the idea is you just plug the computer module into the backplane and then it is responsible for driving the bus signals that allow it to communicate with your other hardware cards. So uh, this is the backplane I will be using in this system. But, but really all you need to have your basic system is just the CPU board. Uh, I do have one ISA card, although it's probably not something I'll have the students use, but it's it's nice to have the option to put other cards in if we want to. Okay, so first let's make sure that this thing works. So uh, I will power it up and see if it boots. All right, so here's our test setup. Here's the 486 board. I'm going to be powering it from the HP bench supply. I just have it set at five volts and the current limit is set at two amps. I think it needs about 1.5 amps. And I have a PS2 keyboard connected to the keyboard connector. And then I have a 15 inch LCD monitor hooked up to the VGA connector. In theory, all I should need to do is power it on. So let's see. All right, there's a beep, that's a good sign. So a yep, uh, little hard to see, but yes, we're getting the, uh, the memory self check here. So it's booted right up. I'm gonna press delete so we can get into the BIOS. All right, here's the uh, award BIOS that is probably bringing back memories for those of you who remember computers of this era. So, okay, this board works. All right, the, the next thing I am going to talk about is how I am planning to actually set this system up in a more permanent form. I obviously don't want to just have it sitting on a, a bench. I want it to be more like an actual computer system. So I have a plan. So let me tell you what I'm going to do. All right, so here is an open frame PC chassis that I got on Amazon for $30. So it's basically a computer case, but without the case. It just consists of a mounting plate and a back frame piece that has the, the slots for your cards and places to screw them in. And then there's a couple of braces here to keep everything rigid. It's actually really nice. I'm pretty pleased with this. And so the idea is that it comes with a whole bunch of, if, we, if you can see here, a bunch of these 632 standoffs, just standard old school motherboard standoffs like you would get with a, in a really old school PC case. And then there are, of course, whole holes, mounting holes here where you can screw these standoffs in. However, the mounting holes are all set up to correspond to an ATX motherboard. And so the issue is our, our backplane is not an ATX motherboard. So the problem is how do we securely mount this backplane onto the chassis here? So here is my idea. So I've installed some, you can see him, uh, one of them just fell out, but you can see I've got three of these motherboard standoffs screwed onto the back of the back 
back plane and I'm just holding them on with some nuts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let it rest here. I'm going to put a couple of ISA cards in, get them perfectly lined up and screwed and screw them in. That should allow us to get the back plane into the perfect placement for where it should be if we want to mount it permanently. And then the only remaining issue is that the mounting holes on the back plane aren't going to line up with the standoff holes in the in the bottom plate here. But that should be okay because what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave a couple of, of mounting holes open when it's on here. I'm just going to get a, a stick with a little, uh, little daub of paint on it poke it through, make dots on the, the mounting plate, and that will tell me where I need to drill holes. So I will use a center punch to make a divot in the perfect place. I have a drill bit and a 632 tap. So I should be able to tap new screw holes into this mounting plate where I can now screw in my motherboard standoffs to get them in the perfect place. And so I'll, uh, I think I'll do the, the two middle ones here at first, and then when those are in, I'll repeat the process and then just do the other four. And ideally, that's going to give me six perfectly positioned tapped screw holes that I can screw these motherboard standoffs into and perfectly mount the back plane here so that the ISA slots line up perfectly with these slots here. And at that point, we can plug in the single board computer. There's a, a place here where you can put an ATX power supply. I have an adapter cable so that I can adapt the uh, the ATX power supply to the AT style power connectors here. And at that point, it just becomes a matter of finding a place to mount some storage devices. So I'm going to use a floppy and an IDE to compact flash adapter. And at that point, we should have a complete system. So let me get the back plane set up here. So uh, it goes this way. Yeah, let me get the back plane set up with a couple cards in it. And then I will try to record the, the screw hole uh, positions here and then I can work on the uh, the drilling and tapping of those holes. So let's let, let's see what happens here. All right, I've got cards lined up at either end of the back plane, so the placement should be just about perfect. And I've got a tiny dab of acrylic paint on the end of a cotton swab where I just cut the cotton off. And so I'm now going to go through and just poke uh, and make a mark right under the screw hole for these two center screw holes. So let's see if we can make that work. All right, so hopefully now we have a couple of nice dots that we can use to guide our screw hole placement for the standoffs. All right, so let's take the back plane off and see how it worked out. All right, it's probably gonna be impossible to see on the camera, but I do have a decent mark right there and right there. And I think that should be good enough to put our holes in to drill and tap and hopefully get standoffs in just the right place for these two center mounting holes in the back plane. So, all right, I am going to take this apart, drill the holes, put the standoffs in, and when we come back, hopefully we should be getting this partially affixed to the back plate. All right, so we have some good progress. I've got standoff here, standoff here. There's a screw in each one. Everything's nice and secure. So this is some good progress. One little oddity that I discovered, these are the standoffs that came with the chassis. The male part is threaded 632, which is pretty standard for a motherboard standoff. Unbeknownst to me, the female part is actually tapped for M3 screws. So you have to screw in with, uh, with M3 screws. A little odd, but it'll work, it's fine. So, okay, so off camera, I will put some some more paint in the holes for the remaining four mounting positions on the back plane. And then I will take it apart again, drill and tap the remaining locations, put standoffs in, and hopefully we'll wind up with six screws and we will completely have this back plane attached permanently to the, the bottom plate here. All right, it took a little doing, but I got all six uh, holes drilled and tapped. I got the standoffs installed. The back plane is now screwed down securely to the chassis. It's not 
absolutely perfect. It's just ever so slightly skewed. So the cards on this side are a little harder to get in than the cards on this side, but it's still totally fine. Um, everything's nice and secure. So I'm pretty happy. All right. So next step will be to actually put the power supply in and see if we can actually power the 486 board from power that's coming through the back plane. And once that works out, then we can start getting the other devices set up. And then I think we'll be in pretty good shape on the hardware. All right, I have the back plane hooked up to a power supply. This is just a standard ATX power supply. I have an adapter cable that adapts the ATX power supply connector to the AT style power supply connectors that the back plane needs. So this adapter cable comes with a couple of quick connect connectors that are meant to attach to just a standard toggle switch or rocker switch. So I have this rocker switch that I found in my parts cabinet. So basically all I should need to do is turn this on on and the computer should power on. All right, there's the beep and we are booting. Okay, so good. Power supply works, back plane works, power supply adapter works. So the next thing I'm going to do is I am going to come up with a mounting solution for the storage devices I want to use. So I have a floppy drive and a compact flash adapter. I think I'm gonna to try to mount them here. And then I want to have a more permanent solution for mounting this switch. So I think we're going to do a little bit of 3D printing now. So let me show you the designs that I've come up with and then we'll see if we can get all of this stuff configured and have a final hardware configuration. All right, here's my solution to the drive mounting. So I want a 3.5 inch floppy drive and I also have a compact flash reader that is 3.5 inch form factor. So my thought is I will print four of these posts and they have a couple of these small ledges that the drive can sit on. So floppy drive on the bottom, compact flash drive on the top. We can screw in from the side using a normal M3 screw. There's a mounting hole in the bottom for a six 32 standard PC case screw. So yeah, four of these should hold up the two drives, no problem. All right, for mounting the rocker switch, it's a pretty simple 3D printed part, just a rectangular cutout for the switch, and then a couple of screw holes on the bottom that I can put 632 screws in. So I'll just mount this to one corner of the frame and that should keep the switch nicely secured. So I will post links to both of these projects in the video description in case you want to do something similar. All right, here is the drive mounting solution. So we have our 3.5 inch floppy drive, we have our compact flash to IDE adapter. And so here are the mounting posts that I 3D printed. And I think it came out pretty well. Everything fits pretty nicely. Uh, these will be strong and secure, I think. So I think what I'll do is just put them right about here on the frame and I'll just need to drill four holes, tap them, go in with 632 PC case screws. And then I think we have a nice permanent solution for the storage devices. All right, here is the 3D printed bracket for the rocker switch, and that seems to have come out okay. I'm going to mount it right here, so that will be a good permanent solution for mounting this switch. All right, so let me get everything completely installed hardware-wise, and at that point, we have a complete system and we can start thinking about software. All right, everything is now set up. I have the floppy drive and the compact flash to IDE adapter connected to power, so I have some SATA to floppy power connectors that they both need, and I have my ribbon cables for the floppy drive and the compact flash to IDE adapter. Everything is hooked up. I have my switch mounted. I am pretty much ready to test the full configuration. I think what I'm going to do is make a set of FreeDOS installation floppies and see if I can actually install an operating system on the compact flash card. All right, so let me make some floppies and then we'll see if we can get this thing working. All right, I have my set of FreeDOS installation disks here. I'm installing FreeDOS only because I want to test the hardware, not because I think DOS is a good operating system. I just want to validate that the Compact Flash card can be treated as a hard drive. All right, so let's boot up and see if we can get FreeDOS installed. Right, memory test takes a little while. All right, hopefully we'll see some activity from the floppy drive here when it decides to boot off of a storage device. There it goes. 
All right, so it has detected the compact flash card as the IDE master device. Okay, this looks like, uh, yeah, here we go with FreeDOS. All right, I am going to get this installed on the compact flash card and I will come back when that's done. All right, so at this point, we have a completely working FreeDOS setup. Uh, everything works great. Hardware seems to work great. This is installed on the compact flash card here. So the only remaining thing that I want to work on is this ATX power supply I'm using has a, a lot of cables that we don't need here. And I would like to do a little bit of cable management here. I actually have an idea to use a different power supply. So let me see if I can tidy this up and get it into its final configuration. All right, here is the final hardware configuration. So I have replaced the original ATX power supply with this Dell Optiplex 7010 power supply. This is actually perfect for this application because it is a standard ATX power supply, but there are relatively few cables. It's basically just motherboard power, CPU power, and four SATA power connectors. And given that we don't really have a lot of things we need to power here, this is perfect. I was able to get the cables tucked back here relatively neatly. I ran and the power to the back plane under the drive cage here. Everything is all tidy at this point. Everything completely works. So I am very pleased with the way this turned out. It is completely ready to test student code or do whatever other kinds of 32-bit x86 things I need to do. So, all right, that is it for this video. Hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you next time.